Dave, when did you start going here? Near as I can figure, about 78. About 78, and I met you in the 80s. And uh, Dave's an old friend of mine, business owner here in town, does a lot of interesting, different things. Keeps him, off, keeps him busy. But I um, uh, found out last year that he's uh, connected with the Union Rescue Mission now and uh, participates in that organization. So I asked him if he'd come and share with us what, what's going on, what they do, and uh, just help us understand what the Union Rescue Mission, what it is and what it isn't, I guess. You know, like we said in the email, it's uh, maybe it's not what we think. So we appreciate you coming up and sharing with us and take it away, guys. Right through that. All right. So the, the uh, ship's captain was on the bridge. He's looking out, just surveying the landscape. He's an island that's deserted. But he looks over to the side. Get in front of the microphone, Dave. He looks over to the side, and he sees smoke on this deserted island. So he tells the first officer, get a boat, go see what's going on. Well, as the, the ship continues, he slowed down to wait for his crew to get back, but he notices that the smoke's actually coming from a smokestack, a structure. And he says, I'll, thinks I'll go to the radio and I'll tell the first officer to come back. Well, he gets to the radio and it crackles and it's the first officer who says, Captain, we've got a castaway, we've got a survivor aboard. Captain's thinking, what? Well, he says, um, he gets out on the deck and the boat comes in and he, everybody gets on board and uh, the first officer told him this guy's been on here on the island for 35 years and the captain thought that's amazing so he starts talking to the guy and turns out he had he, he'd been a castaway 35 years ago the captain said what's that structure that the smoke was coming out of the chimney from he says well you know I was there I had time I had a few skills so I built myself a house made some tools, made a nice house, kind of worked on it over the years. Captain said, that's amazing. He says, what's the structure immediately to the north of the place? And the guy says, well, I'm a God-fearing man. I wanted the proper place to worship. God had rescued me from the sea. So I built myself a church where I could go to worship. Captain just was floored. He said, I'm going to tell everybody about this. He says, what's the structure on the south side of the house? And the guy kind of stuck his hands in his pockets and shuffled his feet and said, well, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Asbury's the church I used to go to. Um, the reason we changed was for family reasons, and uh, we're going to another church, but we are, uh, uh, this is still home. And for those of you who don't know me, um, I know Asbury warts and all. I used to be one of the biggest warts. Okay, so. Uh, it's, it's home, and, uh, and we love the place. So thanks for having us today. Um, I am affiliated with the Union Rescue Mission. I'm on the board, um, and I've got about 12 pages in notes. I'm not going to read them to you verbatim, I promise. Uh, but I keep notes so I can make sure that I'm covering what I'm talking about. Uh, tell me, uh, how many of you know anything at all about the Union Rescue Mission? Just show of hands. Anybody? A few? How many of those who raised your hands, Jim doesn't count, uh, <laughs> because he, he, he knows this stuff, I know he does. How many of you could tell me more than a sentence or two about what happens at the Union Rescue Mission? Good, then we, we'll cover some stuff you haven't heard yet. All right. Well, I'll tell you what I used to think. Um, it was a place to take the drunks so they could have a place to sleep at night and get a meal. That's been a few years ago. Um, Sometime in the late 1970s, early 1980s, I was a janitor at Asbury. I had the key ring and everything, you know, with the 3,000 keys on it, most of which didn't do anything. And one Wednesday night, uh, I was doing my thing and the choir was rehearsing and uh, a lady approached me. She said, there's someone in the sanctuary that I don't think, you know, is from here and you need to check that out. Apparently because I was the senior staff member in charge that night, you know teenager with the key ring. And uh, I spoke with him and, you know, he was just a gentleman that didn't have a place to be. And uh, another fellow from church, Scott Davis, and I gave him a ride to the Union Rescue Mission. That was my first exposure. Um, now that's been a long, long time ago. And until just a couple of years ago, I had no idea that there was more going on there than what we call three hots in a cot, a place to sleep and, and something to eat. Um, 
So let me tell you a little bit of history about URM. In the 1940s, late 1940s, a woman we know only as Miss Ledoux saw a need for a place for the homeless in Wichita. It's always been a problem. Jesus said the poor have always been with us. The Bible's full of examples. Um, and she started working with civic leaders and business leaders. And in 1950, on September 6, 603 East Douglas became the home of the Gospel Service Center. Okay. The name was uh, changed to Union Rescue Mission Incorporated in 1952. Um, the neighbors on East Douglas weren't all that thrilled about the, comp the uh, neighborhood there with the company, and uh, with that and a need for a larger space, the place was moved to six I'm sorry, to uh, St. Francis Street. Um, one thing a lot of people don't know: the URM is actually exclusively a men's shelter. Okay. Most of the services that are provided deal only with men. For a while, uh, five years, uh, 1998 to 2003, there was also a women's shelter. It was called Haven of Hope, and it was opened at a old nursing home that uh, became available on North Hillside. Um, in 2003, uh, there really wasn't a lot of use of Haven of Hope. The, the women's needs, I guess, were being handled elsewhere. They were lesser. I don't really know much about that time in that regard. But uh, the uh, downtown facility was really just burgeoning. There was no way to take care of the men that needed help. And so uh, the decision was made to close Haven of Hope and convert that into the Union Rescue Mission facility. And ever since, URM has been on North Hillside. Now, Let me ask you guys a couple of questions here. How many of you are worried about whether or not you're going to eat tonight? Or do you have a place to sleep tonight or tomorrow? Not because of the dumb thing you said to your wife on the way out. You'll get back past that. We always do, right? But let's face it. You know, most of us aren't really worried about that. Will you lock your doors behind you when you go to bed tonight? Some, some won't. Some country type folks, but most of us, most of us do. There's a, a separation between us and the world. It makes sleeping more comfortable. Now, think about. We always think about the homeless at Christmas time. You know, we'll do the the Thanksgiving meal with some organization or another, and we'll we'll feel badly for the guy sleeping under the bridges. But the fact of the matter is, these guys will sleep under those bridges. 365 days a year, or over in Nasker Park, or in a lot of other places. And very often, they're making decisions like, do I sleep over behind the bushes to get some privacy, or do I sleep in front of the bushes so if somebody attacks me, at least somebody else might see. This isn't just when it's cold. This is every day, every year. And the Union Rescue Mission is open. 24-7, 365. Uh, I will tell you that in last year, over 42,000 beds were provided, average being 116 nightly. Uh, the food services uh, averages nearly 260 meals a day, or a little over, excuse me, over 95,000 meals served last year. In addition, uh, we do have clothing stores that are from donations, and you know, people get fresh clothes. We have laundry available. Uh, you ever thought about not having access to deodorant or razors or any other personal hygiene products? Well, those are available. Uh, we haven't forgotten downtown. We still do bus runs because that seems to be the large, it is the largest congregation point for homeless in Wichita. So we'll, rather than making them try to find their way, you know, all that way north to North Hillside, uh, we do bus runs. And it's, we work with Open Door in that. Uh, Open Door is kind of the gateway for homeless services in Wichita, and so that's that's the bus points. Um, you know, obviously, it's the goal is spiritual as well as physical needs. We we definitely start out by need, by by working to meet physical needs of people. It's it's important. Um, there's no point to trying to teach a man about salvation if his stomach is is empty and he's, he's focused on that. Uh, these are things I learned 
just a few years ago, after I took the tour, that it was so much more than the three hots in a cot. It's, it's not about just trying to heal the immediate, it's about offering ways out. And that's one of the reasons in uh, a while back, let's see, I want to say it was, uh, golly, oh, here it is, um, 1990s, a program was started to try to help men get out of the habits that caused the type of homelessness they're dealing with in the first place, the, the addictions and things of that nature. There had always been uh, counselors and mentors and vol well, volunteers who would assume those roles, either as a, a part of, the, of the, their jobs at the mission, or, but, or it would just be befriending men. After a lot of these people like us found out that people like them weren't really so as much us and them as just us. And, and we could talk to each other. That was hard. I mean, it really is hard sometimes to get past that separation of I'm a normal person and, well, maybe he's not. You get close to some of these guys and you suddenly realize, hey, they're no different than I am. That's hard for some people to, to make that jump. Um, I'm kind of running through some of this because I want to give you quite a few facts and I want to uh, introduce you to someone else who's going to speak for us in a minute. Uh, but I also want to leave a lot of time for questions if we possibly can, okay? Um, so when we start talking about these, these programs, uh, there are several things that we do, and I'll be honest with you, they're, they're tough love programs. In some cases, they're becoming tougher. We've had men who have lived at the shelter effectively for years and years and years and years. The problem with that is there wasn't a lot of impetus for change. You know, we found that if we just give and don't ask anything back, we can enable the habits and, and make it to where it becomes part of the lifestyle. It's, it's like a lot of other programs that I won't mention because our government funds them and I'm going to try not to be political today. Um, but we do have in addition to the overnighters, basically, is what we call them, programs um, to try to help these guys get out of that position in life. Um, the basic one is, is uh, called STEPS, uh, Steps Toward Economic and Personal Stability. Um, men can receive lodging and clothing and, and other help at the mission, meals obviously, uh, for up to 90 days and uh, they have to attend Bible study and uh, life skills classes. And the life skills are uh, basic accountability, uh, dealing with decision making, uh, how to study the Bible, things of that nature. And they're accountable during that time to a case manager who's making sure that they're using that, those things wisely. Uh, I'll talk more about the accountability in a minute. And then there's another level of that that goes quite a bit uh, more in depth. It's a nine-month program called New Beginnings. Started in 1992 as the New Life program. And they live, the guys who are in this program, live at the mission for nine months. Uh, during this time, there are a number of required classes and activities that they have to participate in. Uh, accountability, anger management, uh, how to get and hold a job. We call it Jobs for Life. Uh, biblical finance. How many of you have needed a biblical? Well, I'm not going. Don't raise your hands. But how many of us have needed a little help figuring out how to manage our finances God's way? Um, what we call every man's battle, and that's pornography. And let's face it, guys, which of us doesn't, you know, have a, a normal sexual urge? Uh, it's, now, couple that with an addictive personality and a history of already being toward the bottom, bad decisions. Uh, it's tough enough for the rest of us. Okay, so that's a big one. Uh, just basic character training and making decisions with biblical principles. There's, there's actually quite a few things that go on through this and you can ask about anything you're, you're interested in there. But again, these are tough love programs. Within the first 30 days, the guys have to stop smoking. How many smoke? 80%? Uh, that's a very high number. Yeah, almost. I mean, that's tough. Almost if you've ever smoked, 
uh, and gotten addicted to it, then you'll appreciate how tough that is. Um, I will tell you about some of these programs too. Not everybody gets through it the first time. You know, uh, counselors will tell, every overnighter gets an opportunity to hear about the options available to them besides just the three hots and a cot, okay? Um, and guys will say, you know, that sounds good. Uh, and maybe it's the first night, maybe it's many nights in, maybe it's quite a while later, they'll say, I need to do that. But then they get into it and, boy, they told me how tough this was going to be. Or something in the old world will draw them back out and they won't succeed. And some, many of those will come back in. Uh, we've had guys that have, we've had, thank you, Lawrence. We've had guys that uh, have been in the program two, three, I think four. I think five times is the max I've heard of. Uh, I don't remember, but and you know that's okay if they're in a position in their life where they're ready. We believe and they believe that they're ready to come back in and and really try to make that change. We want to facilitate that, uh, but it's not easy. It, it really isn't easy because it's not easy to change your life, and everybody wants an easy path. It's like everybody wants the easy diet program, you know, and it. it We've not found a way to do it easy. So anyway, these programs exist to offer those opportunities. Um, we have a working guest program. Uh, there are often men who are referred to the URM from partnering agencies, including the Department of Corrections, uh, people who have jobs, but they need a place to, to live. Uh, these are men who are employed at least 24 hours a week. Uh, but they can't really find a place to live. Uh, and we can, at that point, give them a place they can stay uh, and help them get to work um, via some transportation options that we've got. Uh, we've actually got a, uh, what we call a social enterprise. Um, a lot of uh, rescue missions operate around the country, operate uh, uh, thrift stores. Um, we used to have one, wasn't really doing a lot. Uh, and we were actually going to do mattress recycling a couple of years ago we started looking at this. Uh, it was being very successful in Washington. Our executive director went up and to look at that and they said, you know what, the mattress recycling is becoming subject to some regulations. It's harder to get rid of some of the raw materials. Why don't you look at book resale? And we've opened up what's called New Leaf Books. And New Leaf is a place where people take old books. We take donations from schools and libraries, things like that. Uh, and we have men who will go through those and they'll look them up if they're in good condition and if they're sellable, we'll list them for resale online and ship them out. The things that aren't resellable uh, go into bin for pulp. You know, nothing's thrown away, nothing makes the landfill. The same is true of clothing, things like that. Uh, everything that comes in, food, donations, clothing, books, uh, personal hygiene products, all that, we either use it directly, we give it away directly to community members, I'll tell you about that in a minute while I beat up on the microphone, uh, or we'll give it to another organization that helps. But anyway, uh, New Leaf Books employs men who are in the program or, come, or have come out of the program. Uh, it gets them some work history. That's kind of a big deal when you don't have any work history. Uh, it gets them basically an expectation that they're gonna show up when they're scheduled to work you know, they're going to follow the instructions of a supervisor. Uh, there's a little bit of computer activity that can go on, quite a bit if, if they take to that. So there are, there are options to learn how to work as well. Uh, we have hopes that New Leaf will eventually fund itself. Uh, it's not there, but it's a good ministry and uh, it's helpful. Uh, we also have training for real world jobs. Uh, we've had several guys who, uh, through some grants and donations, have gone to truck driving school and learned to drive over the road. And those are pretty good jobs. Uh, it's a challenging job. You're alone all the time, so if you have an addictive personality, you better be close to Jesus. Uh, but we've gotten some really good reports back from guys that we worked with uh, the truck driving schools with. And boy, they, I think every one of them's gotten a job pretty quick out of school from that. Um, if that's their thing, it works out really well. Um, we also have uh, what's called our kitchen prep program. And kitchen prep is, is a, it's a great thing for the mission because 
we feed lots and lots and lots of people. And so we've got this nice industrial kitchen. Um, and what we did a few years back was started a program where unemployed or underemployed people in the community could learn to work in a commercial kitchen. And they work alongside our in-house chef. In some cases, guest chefs will teach lessons. Uh, they'll actually serve meals to the men. Uh, and they'll do some catering events, things like that. So again, they're learning. There is a cost to the program, but there's scholarships available too. Uh, we have people who aren't mission guests who will come to it. They just want to do something better in life. Uh, but because it also serves the mission, uh, you know, the guys are getting uh, a really good meal that is far more than what you'd picture at the soup kitchen with the big ladle and the big hairy guy, you know, dumping it on the, the bowl. This is good food. <laughs> Sorry, Stan. I didn't realize you were sitting right there. Uh, <sighs> anyway, um, medical. We have a relationship with Grace Med. Uh, three nights a week we have a clinic there and we also have a Friday night clinic for up to 10 patients who can uh, see a, uh, an MD or a nurse practitioner. We have a, uh, another program for uh, respite care. Uh, currently we have 11 men at the mission who are um, in some need of a place to be while they're recovering from injury or medical situation. Uh, and they, they can't be out on the street, basically, and recover. They have to be ambulatory, uh, which means they have to be able to take care of their own bathroom needs. They have to be able to, to function within a, a community, uh, but they just need a little extra help. Uh, we have a full-time staff member, Julie Wadan, fantastic gal, uh, works tirelessly and uh, is a real asset to the mission. Julie is a registered nurse, and she is working really hard on a grant that will allow us to expand that into a significantly greater degree of care for those who really aren't nearly as ambulatory. So that's a really exciting thing because frankly guys, there are guys who are just dying under these bridges. You know, uh, they start going downhill, something happens, whether it's an accident, an injury, illness, whatever it may be, uh, or just, you know, late in life and a, a hard life on the body. And what a horrible way to die and unnecessary in so many cases. So uh, we're really excited about what's going to happen with that. Um, I'll tell you what, uh, talking about the programs, I think this is a really good time to stop and let you hear from somebody who's lived it rather than just a guy who sees it. So I have Jared Brewer with me today, and uh, please make him feel welcome, and I'll just let Jared tell you his story. Morning guys, as he said, my name is Jared Brewer. Um, I'm part of the New Beginnings program. There's three phases and I'm actually in the third phase. Uh, I'll be completing, uh, towards the end of August, I'll be completing the uh, New Beginnings program. Um, this is actually my second time through, as he said, you know, some of us come back a second time. Uh, different curriculum though from the last time I was in. Um, you know, it's been a blessing. Uh, just wanted to share with you guys a popular uh, we all know about the prodigal son you know and that's something I live on a daily basis you know I've watched God's restoration in my life and his mercy that he's shown me um, on a December 31st of 2017 I made a decision to drive drunk uh, and I wrecked my car you know and I lost it I lost everything that you know I had and uh, you know I I went on to um, my appendix, uh, I mean, I, it was crazy. Everything happened in a matter of 30 days. Uh, my appendix, I had to go get my appendix removed. Never had surgery before. Uh, my, you know, my dog got sick because he ate some marijuana that I had had, and I didn't realize how poisonous that was to, to dogs at the time. And this is something I really cared about. Um, then also, you know, uh, you know, the sec, the last week of January. Uh, my particular drug of choice is methamphetamines, um, and it, it's destroyed my life more than once. You know, uh, when I came through the first time, I was on three different probations in two different counties uh, because of methamphetamines and the choices that, you know, you would make on this drug. Um, since then, I've completed all legal action, and um, 
I'm totally off of papers for the first time since I was 18 years old. I'm 20, I'll be 25 in November. Um, you know, so watching God do that in itself was amazing to me uh, because I'd never completed a probation before. Uh, you put me in jail long enough before you just realized that I wasn't going to complete. You just, you know, give me the term of my sentence and I'd complete and you'd let me off and we'd just go round and round again. Um, so to complete three probations in two different counties, that was God's, you know, provision in itself. Um, I worked at HOC Industries for a year and four months, um, which I had lost my job in, in, the, in January because of my decision to relapse on methamphetamines. Uh, you know, for me, I'm an intravenous drug user, which means, you know, I use the needle. And uh, it's crazy how much that controls your life. Uh, the addiction to not just the drug, but the process itself. And then watching God deliver me from that. You know, I've been clean and sober now since, you know, the, the last week of January. You know, um, I quit smoking the, the day I came in the program. David, he's one of the case managers there, uh, said, you know, have you started smoking? And I said, yeah. And he goes, so how was your last cigarette? And I said, you know, as good as the first. Um, I haven't smoked since. It was, you know, that, you know, again, is God's provision in my life. You know, none of these things that have been accomplished, you know, not even me staying in the program, uh, because I'll tell you, it's one of the hardest things that I've ever done. Um, voluntarily staying in a place where you have limited freedom, uh, especially when you know there's other alternatives, you know, especially when you know there's places that you could go and you could leave, but knowing it's God's will for you to stay. Uh, I mean, it was tough, you know. Um, any of the case managers tell you I wasn't always the happiest person and um, but I've watched God work it out you know when I came back I didn't start over again I watched these guys you know the case managers that I had relationships with before just really show me love you know honestly want you know to see me do well and uh, one of the things is shame and guilt when you, especially when you come back and you finish before you know um, but there was none of that. It was like as soon as I walked in, you know, everybody was, you know, we're glad to have you here. We're glad that you're safe. Uh, for me, the Union Rescue Mission really displays Christ's love. It's the most, it's the rawest form of church that I have found. You know, it's honestly given back to those who have nothing. You know, a lot of us come in with, you know, we're bruised and battered. A lot of us have addiction issues. Uh, and they honestly serve the best way they know how. You know, and they love us through it. You know, some of us are really hard to love, especially when we first get in there. You know, um, God has got a lot of working to do, uh, a lot of bandages to pull. You know, but these guys walk you through it. Um, you know, now that I'm coming to the end of this thing, it's been a blessing to, to have come back again. You know, um, and you know, God doesn't make mistakes. I know He called me there the first time, and I know I'm back for the second time. And God accomplished what He was intended to accomplish in my life the first time. You know, um, He knew in His sovereignty that I was going to make these mistakes. He knew that I was going to go out and I was going to turn away from Him and I was going to go back to a life of sin. But He also knew that on the second week of February that I was going to come back to the Union Rescue Mission and I was going to start turning my life back around. That I was going to start coming back to Him in a relationship. You know, so that's where I put my trust now, is that God is not surprised. You know, there is such a freedom in knowing that God is not surprised by our sin. You know, that God wasn't like, oh gosh, Jared, you know, you relapsed again. You know, it wasn't, because uh, it really gets rid of the shame and guilt, because if He's not surprised and He loves me anyways, then, then what do I have to be ashamed about? You know, um, and then the freedom of repentance, uh, coming back to Him and just serving again. Um, one of the greatest things that I've got to do is to serve men in the building there, you know. Because uh, one thing that's weird about when you start living there, because a lot of people who don't know the, uh, the Union Rescue Mission is, you just see it as a homeless shelter. Mm. Well, you know, people that live outside, you know, kind of, you know, that must suck, you know, living in a homeless shelter. But really, once you've been there for long enough, it's, it's your home. You know, these are, they're not more homeless people, they're your roommates. You know, you have a hundred and some roommates every night. Um, and as a part of the program, we serve those guys. We clean the mission. Uh, we lay out their mats in the evenings. We have an overflow that houses, uh, puts about 49 mats as a full chapel. 
And you know, this is for people who won't sleep in the main dorm. There's, you know, it's an overflow. And we get to serve these these guys. We serve them breakfast. We do the dishes. And uh, you know, we see a lot of hurting people. You know, and in the time that I've been there, I've watched reoccurring cases of people that you see come back for years. You know, and it's become a lifestyle. Um, but you see hope. You see the guys that come in, they join the program. And uh, something I was sharing with my mentor, it's like living in God's body shop. You know, you get to watch guys come in, and you, especially guys that you've known before that from the street, you know, you know their past and these things, and you get to watch God change them. You know, you get to actively see them change from phase to phase. Uh, and there's nothing like watching God work in people's lives. You know, I have a dear friend that he's, he's about to go to college uh, to become a pastor. You know, Rocky Perez. What a wonderful friend he is. You know, and I've watched God do amazing things in that man's life. And he's been sober now for nine years. And he came back and just, you know, because not everybody that comes to New Beginnings has an addiction problem. It's a life restoration program, as you know, uh, as Tom, the director, likes to say, uh, because it's not particularly geared towards people with addiction. It's geared towards getting you a relationship with Christ. You know, so uh, getting that focus back. You know, because we're all lost without Him. You know, and that's what I found this last time around is how much I really need Him. You know, if it taught me anything, it's you know, I am completely and utterly lost without Him. Uh, so I thank you guys for the time that you've allowed me to share with you guys, and um, it's been a blessing, you know, uh, so thank you. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Are you presently employed? No. Uh, during the New Beginnings program, we live and uh, we work at the bookstore. We uh, serve at the bookstore there. Um, but everything, all of our needs are completely met by the Union Rescue Mission during those nine months. Well, you have previous work experience? Yes. Yes. Uh, tell me about that. Um, at HOC, I was an operator. I operated an automated machine for a year and a half almost. Um, before that, I worked concrete. Um, but during the, the the program, it's you can't. They don't want you getting a job. They, it's okay, a. I and, understand that. Yeah. Is it going to be hard for you to get to sit gainful employment in <clears throat> criminal history? No. No, um, they actually have an employment coordinator there that actually helps you um, seek out jobs. Um, through that Jobs for Life, we build a resume and those things. Um, so it's, I mean, really it's trusting God with the employment. You know, that's what I did last time. So they have a, they have a list of companies they can go to that will take people that have been through the program. Um, I think they have relationships. Definitely there's relationships in the community. Um, like HOC um, was one of those previous relationships they had. They'd already employed two of the guys from New Beginnings previously. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, let's, let's do that okay. after. Okay. If you don't okay. Yeah. Don't want to cut off the questions? Yeah. What, is there an age group but the majority of the people that are in the system? Is there we get demographic reports, and uh, you walk around, and no. Uh, it goes all the way up. It, it, we, we get older men, and we get very young men. Is it, there a majority of them younger men? Or? I'd say the majority are probably 30s, 40s. Uh, 40 to 50. Years. 40 to 50, okay. All right. And we'll, we're going to have time for more questions, but I do want to tell you a few more things. Um, you know, listening to Jared, you know, who's lived it, um, I'm sure that's wow. You know, it was wow for me the first time. Uh, it still is. Um, one of the things I want to tell you, though, about URM, we are a men's shelter, but we also do things for families, for women. Uh, there is a group of women just starting who are wives, uh, even ex-wives, uh, of men who've gone through our programs, who've used <coughs> resources at the shelter, and they will tell you about the impact that URM has on their families. You change a man, you change a family. You know, you change a child's life. In some cases, multiple children, if, if that's in play. Um, it, it's a big deal. Um, we also give away food boxes uh, of donated food, uh, diapers, uh, for infant formula, things of that nature. 
Uh, we've kind of become a, uh, one of the places in Wichita where uh, that happens. So it's not just about the, uh, the men, it's, it's overall. Um, you may have noticed these boards up here. Um, one of the challenges that we've had for years is that a man coming out of a program uh, really ha doesn't have a current work history, doesn't have a current rent history. It's hard to find a place to live, especially one you can afford that's not basically a rat hole where you pay by the day or a week. Uh, Eagle's Wing is the vision for that. Uh, and the idea behind Eagle's Wing is 24 apartments uh, where a man who's coming out of the programs can lease an apartment uh, for a significantly lower price uh, but while they're working and can afford that. And uh, up to a year, we'll have, uh, we'll have some rent history and, and uh, the uh, several things are needful there. There's going to be some more office space which allows us to open up space in the main building uh, for additional programs like the respite program I told you about. Uh, there will also be a much needed storm shelter. Um, we're way up on North Hillside. There's not just a whole lot around and there's, it's, it's on a slab. There's no place to hide. So, you know, storm shelters are kind of a big deal, but this is really exciting. Um, we, we broke ground in the spring and we're hoping to uh, start having uh, men living there early next year. Uh, it's really exciting to see it go up. So if you happen to be driving along North, North Hillside, Make sure you look over there. It's fun to watch. Uh, Simpson Construction is putting that up for us. Uh, we work with the community. Um, we have a great relationship with law enforcement. Uh, the, I don't know if you know about the HOT team, but if you, uh, a lot of times you'll see police officers working with homeless people or talking to folks on the corners. And I remember the days when I saw Wichita police have four and five cars swoop in on a guy standing on the corner was obviously homeless and basically rough them up. Um, I haven't seen that for a very, very, very long time. Uh, we actually have a hot team. Uh, Nate, the lead officer, has uh, gone to significant classes and worked with other communities who do this. Hot is homeless outreach team. Uh, these are a few officers who are trained specifically in dealing with the needs of the homeless. They work with uh, programs for homeless like Open Door, like URM. Uh, others that so they they have places where they can take people who need help where they can refer them instead of being a part of the problem uh, they do have and I can get you the number where you can call the hot team directly if you have a concern about a panhandler or some person who looks like they need help and not really feel like you're turning them in to get thrown in the pokey uh, these guys will help uh, unfortunately it's a underfunded program it's 8 to 5 Monday through Friday right now okay uh, you'll notice there's a lot less panhandling 8 to 5 Monday through Friday. And that, uh, I'll come back to that one. Uh, working with the community, our executive director, Denny Bender, who is a godsend, uh, uh, is on the city's homeless task force. Uh, he works with uh, government and organizations to try to identify the problems as they change and work on community ways to deal with that as well as our individual contribution. Uh, we're also on the Community Council for Homeless Advocacy. These are groups where we kind of work with each other and kind of help each other and frankly watch each other to make sure that we're actually helping. Uh, that's all, also along with the Wichita Homeless Coalition. I wanted to point out uh, somewhere in your packets you've got there is a deal on uh, real change, not spare change. That's a fairly new deal. We all talk about the guys on the street corners, the panhandlers, and everybody's got a different take on those guys. Um, here's what we know to be true. There are professional panhandlers who move from city to city. They have handlers. The, the panhandlers don't get all the money. In fact, they don't get a majority of it. It goes to the handlers. And you don't know which one you're giving to. Uh, the traditional thing has always been true. The main concern that if I give them a, a dollar or a five or a 20, uh, it's going to go straight to to liquor or drugs or whatever it is. And there is a percentage of that. And some of those guys really do need help. How do you know which is which? Okay, are you contributing to the problem? Are you just funding some, some, somebody's enterprise or are you actually helping someone? Here's the deal, guys. There are organizations in Wichita, we're one of them, uh, who are accountable to provide real help. If you wanna help these guys, help one of these organizations. 
that's real help. Um, if you're comfortable doing so, stop and talk to them about some of these, these opportunities that are available. If nothing else, just tell them URM's on Hillside. A lot of guys will offer to give them a ride. Most of the time they won't go. They've already been coached on that. Some won't go because there's a spiritual aspect to it and they don't want to have Jesus rammed down their throats. We do have chapel every night. You don't have to go to chapel to have a meal. You do if you want to have a bed, but you don't if you, if you want a meal. We did that because of some things with the way we get our food. Um, but it does give them a choice. We also have church on Sunday morning. A lot of guys don't want anything to do with that. There are still other facilities in Wichita for those guys to have food uh, and even shelter that you can help with. So we highly recommend, the Wichita Police Department highly recommends not giving money direct to panhandlers. Okay, so there's, there's that. Um, Acts 3, 6, Peter said, Silver and gold I have none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. So, uh, there's that. Um, we are entirely privately funded. Uh, individuals, churches, organizations, businesses, civic groups, no government, no United Way. Okay? And that's because of, their, of criteria that, well, just don't fit. It doesn't fit with us. Uh, costs us about $2.15 to provide a meal. And it's a good meal. A really, would you attest that it's a good meal? We're not talking about slop soup here. Um, we are a member of a national organization formerly known as AGRM, the Association of Gospel Rescue Missions. It was just rebranded as CityGate. It's a bunch of places who offer services like ours, not always exactly. We work together, we hold each other accountable, uh, and we learn. And we are in the process as a mission of redoing a lot of things and rethinking the way we've done a lot of things over a lot of years, and that's led to some of the things we're talking about today. We report to GuideStar and the Evangelical Council of Financial Authority, EFCA, or ECFA, uh, to show that the money's handled appropriately. Um, we're governed by a 11-member board of directors, and we have 35 full and part-time staff members, including some men, uh, again, who are uh, program men or former program men uh, who are working their way through a new life. Um, so here's the pitch. If you want to help, uh, donations are always good. You know, uh, we can always use money. That's as much as I'm going to give you on that one, but we can use the money. Believe me, it'll go well. Uh, we'll take food, canned goods. Uh, we'll take meats, fresh or, or uh, canned. Uh, processed wild game can be given away in the food boxes. Uh, diapers, any baby needs, toiletries, uh, good clothes, shoes, foot spray. Believe me, it's, you know, it's one of those things most of us don't think about. Um, books for New Leaf. Um, Eagle's Wing, there's still time. We've paid for the building, uh, $3.5 million. What a blessing, what a gift. Uh, we've got the brick and mortar. We still need some furniture, and it's going to cost some to get things open. You guys know how that works. Um, I will tell you at URM, nothing donated goes to waste. Uh, extra food, clothes, whatever, uh, it's all given it to people that we serve directly or to other organizations. Even the books that aren't sellable will go to pulp, uh, so it's recycled. Uh, time. Uh, if you as individuals, uh, you as a family, we can't take kids. We have sex offenders that will stay there. Uh, but uh, you can come and, and volunteer. You can serve in the kitchen. Uh, you know, as, as church, uh, Sunday school classes often do that, things like that. Uh, we have some neat ways that that can happen. Uh, we have uh, activities where we, we'll, we can use a group of people. Uh, if you want to do something more regular, you can help in the book recycling center. You can drive, driving men to work, things like that. Uh, evening help in the chapel. Um, we have a prayer ministry where during the day uh, someone goes around, touches a bed, and prays for the man who will sleep there that night. Every bed, every day. Um, you got an hour, you know, uh, or you got a year. I mean, it's there. Prayer. Uh, big on prayer. Every day. Safety. Safety for the people. Um, workers will be lifted up, but they'll see the works of, of their hands by their God. Um, more opportunity, uh, transition. We have a CEO who has stuck with us much longer than he agreed to. Great man, but he's 
ready to retire. And we're actively beginning the search for a new CEO. That is crucial. If you want something, one thing to add to your prayer list, only one thing, that's huge because that's, that really affects the future of the mission is that God will bring us that right man. Um, and we are considering more opportunities for women and children's services. Um, we keep talking about all the reasons we can't do it and they're very good reasons. It keeps coming up and many of us have recognized that and we're not sure what God wants us to do there. But he's going to tell us and he will provide. Um, if you want to become more involved, if you want to learn more, uh, you can go to urmwichita.com, sign up for the What's Happening email list if you want that, or you just talk to me. Uh, we have Lunch and Learns. You'll find an invitation here in uh, your packet that's uh, it's third Thursdays. Uh, we do like RSVPs. Again, you can talk to me. If you want to come to one of those, I, uh, I will make sure I'm there, if at all possible, on the Thursday you want to come. Uh, we also have a banquet coming up on November 1st. It, there will be a lunch and an evening banquet. That's our main yearly thank you uh, to the community. And uh, anyone who's interested in that, you, your, your wives, family members, friends, uh, please talk to me and I will happily make you my guest. So um, that's everything I had on the paper. It took a little longer than I planned, but now I promised I'd open up for questions. So please ask anything you want to know from me or Jared. I want to thank you for coming. I've got two questions for you. What about veterans? Do you have any veterans? There are always veterans. There are always veterans. It's, uh, you know, veterans have unique issues in many cases. And, you know, a veteran is someone who served during a wartime. So, you know, some of these guys, you know, never left Wichita. But we also have people with PTSD issues, uh, you know, and, and their needs are no less real no matter what their needs are and no more real because they're veterans, but they can be very special needs. Do you have anybody from the VA to come down for talks? Uh, our people do work with the VA as well as other organizations to help find benefits that are due, things of that nature. Open Door is really good at that. Uh, there's another, I can't think of the name, there's another group in Wichita who specializes mm -hmm. in working with vets who don't know the benefits that they have available. Thank you for that. Okay. Second question I have, um, his girlfriend, they got married in jail in Topeka. Mm -hmm. um, they have moved back here, but he's looking for support. Um, he lives around Washington Street. He just called me last night. Um, but great guy, he believes in the Lord. Um, his wife also, I can't remember his name. I have met her. She is out of jail. They have a child. Um, where could I refer them? Open door. Open door. Would be the first place I would go. Okay. Um, these guys know what's available in Wichita, or they know who to send people to. Okay. Um, we do have food boxes and things like that available, but it sounds like there may be needs beyond what URM provides directly. Uh, and open door is a good gateway for people in that situation. Okay. Okay. I appreciate that, Dave. You betcha. Come on, guys. We're here. So what about opportunities for retired guys to help in the life skills or transitioning okay. into the business world? Of okay. What could, could we do? Can we help them with interview skills, resume skills? Mm -hmm. What? Is um, that too far? Well, first off, uh, we, we took a board vote, and we do not discriminate against retired guys. Okay. Um, so, I, I appreciate your question. I just had to throw that in. Um, the uh, volunteer opportunities are numerous, and that specific one's a good one. Uh, we always have uh, a capable person always has someone to, something to offer. And I'm thinking specifically of uh, the jobs training that's done and uh, as, as part of uh, New Beginnings, and uh, I'm sure, Jared, I, you would probably see more than I would in that regard. Um, really, there's a need for mentorship. You know, there's always a need for men to have a mentor. Uh, that's something that's lacking. Um, a lot of guys, for me, it's been very beneficial to have a mentor. Um, I've had my mentor since I started there. Uh, it's something that, you know, there's always a need for. I mean, there's more guys than there is people to volunteer. 
So um, in that regard, it'd be great to have somebody to come alongside. You know, even if you're not directly in the classroom, but you, you have individual, you know, uh, influence on this guy's life. Uh, so. If you have a specific skill, mentorship is, is absolutely, that's the other one I would have mentioned, that uh, if you have a specific skill that you want to know about, uh, let me know. You know, or something that you're specifically interested in doing, let me know or call the mission. You don't have to go through me, but, you know, I'm perfectly willing to be the go between and find out how we can can uh, implement or utilize what you've got to offer, Dick. I understand you say, Dave, that you no longer salvage uh, furniture and postal business and that kind of thing. Really don't have much for that. The best place for that is uh, his helping hands on 37th Street, uh, just uh, west of Hydraulic. Um, just don't have room. Salvation Army used to do a lot of that kind of thing. They did. His, uh, I don't know if they still do or not, but I do know they don't. Okay. Really His helping I hands is, is the best place. Obviously, you know, if it's, if it's trash, it needs to be it's trashed, good. but uh, his helping hands does a lot of re recycling of appliances and furniture and things like that, good furniture, so things like that. What about prison ministry? URM doesn't directly do prison ministries. Obviously, there are, are great organizations. Uh, you know, most of us know CMO uh, from many years ago, uh, Christian Ministries to Offenders that works in the jails. There are others uh, locally and uh, at Cedric County in El Dorado, uh, especially in Hutch. Um, URM uh, gets a lot of folks out of those environments. Uh, you know, we, they are released to us, uh, and that continues there. Am I missing something on that, Jared? Okay. Uh, our chaplain used to be the chaplain he for was. Sunday County. Yeah. I, so if you needed resources as right. far as that's concerned, uh, Jay Lewis is our chaplain, and he used to be the chaplain for the Sedgwick County Jail. So he would have resources in that aspect to give out. Yeah, uh, that's Christian Ministries to Offenders uh, is that group, and Scott Davis was chaplain from Asbury for, for many years. Jay Lewis uh, was chaplain for several years, and Jay is, is our current chaplain uh, at URM. So, um, but we don't, we, we work with the guys who are out more than in directly, but there are certainly good organizations out there and they can use help too. You know, so try to change lives every step of the way. Okay, um, again, any questions, any thoughts, uh, you know, most, many of you have my phone number. If you don't, I'll be glad to give it to you. Uh, lunch and learn, banquet, please consider, uh, consider checking it out more. Um, it's an amazing ministry. I'm proud to be part of it. Uh, I feel a little bit like Balaam's donkey. God can even use me. So, thanks, guys. Thank you, Dave. <laughs>
move them closer to you and to uh, help them become the kind of men and providers and families and uh, that you would have them be. So Father, we just thank you for today. Thank you again for the rain. And we ask that you just be with us this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.